it seems to be. Let me um, recap very briefly uh, where we are with this. Um, this period in the Enlightenment between 1700 and 1800, uh, the invention of this new way of seeing the world, which is called landscape, we call landscape. And um, other aspects of this period include the development of the, it includes the Industrial Revolution. And that probably more than anything other than automobiles will impact cities, particularly the growth of cities, uh, in extraordinary ways, um, as we'll see. So the importance of this sort of invention of this concept of landscape is that prior to about 1700, um, what we would call landscapes or gardens and so forth uh, basically are all involved with perspectival space and right angles, uh, symmetrically composed more or less. Um, and because of the structure of this, it becomes very easy to pop these trees out here and put, put buildings in. I mean, that very easily can become a perimeter block of apartment buildings or whatever. This, of course, is the Champs-Élysées. Um, this area outside the Tuileries was known as the Elysian Fields. And uh, it went up to the horizon, which would be ultimately the location of the Arc de Triomphe uh, constructed by Napoleon in the early part of the 1800s. When this revolution of, of this invention of landscape comes about, epitomized here by the English landscape garden known as Stourhead, um, this and this have a relationship, and this and this, this drawing by Le Corbusier uh, in his conception of the ideal city, which is in effect one huge public park uh, with a series of buildings that are sort of plopped down out in this pasture. Uh, we looked at examples of, of, of this. Uh, Bath, which is probably the single best example of the evolution of this from um, this sort of Roman then to this medieval world that we saw here, to Queen Square uh, by John Wood the Elder, which is um, right here. Uh, based on the London residential squares in the West End of London, the success of that led to further speculative real estate developments that we see here, such as the Royal Circus, and then the extension of this down to this remarkable building here, um, which is known as the Royal Crescent, that opens out across this pasture that we see up here with a ha-ha wall inserted so that you could and let the sheep graze, and so on and so forth, and you could sit in your um, living room or your parlor and look out across this pastoral landscape, imagining that you were somewhere, I suppose, in southern Italy. Um, the high wall is a peculiar thing. It was, uh, in a sense, the sort of precursor of the, uh, as I said, the sort of architectural curtain wall, which blurs the distinction between this side and that side, which merges interior space to exterior space. And that's sort of what's happening here. And that on the uphill side, the illusion is created that there is no wall at all, uh, but the cows or the sheep get down in here and they can't get up over the wall. So you could design with this haha -ha wall, uh, and then you could create these sort of uh, pastoral conditions where if we imagine these soccer players are actually sheep, we sort of get the, um, the, um, the idea. Now, let me um, pause here for a moment to point out that um, sort of up until this point in time, sheep were pretty valuable. They still were uh, and still are um, because you could do things with them, uh, meaning that you could uh, shear them and make wool, keep you warm in the winter. You could use the skins to give people diplomas from Georgia Tech, although we don't use actual sheepskin anymore. Um, you could eat them. You could make cheese from them. You could do all kinds of things. Um, but these are not sheep that you eat. These are sheep that now have become aestheticized. In other words, you look at them. You look at them. Um, one way to perhaps describe this is that the sheep now become ornament. 
but um, in fact they become an essential ingredient within this pastoral, this preference for the pastoral uh, environment that tends to emerge uh, in the early decades of the 1700s, um, primarily in England. Um, this begins to affect cities not only in Bath where these things are kind of built from scratch, but in the um, sort of surgery that begins to be performed in medieval cities that by this time have um, sort of outgrown their boundaries and have become a kind of problem breeding ground for all sorts of public health issues and so forth. Edinburgh, um, this medieval town that we see here with the castle, this burg, and then the bishop's palace here, and then this causeways, these two causeways, actually they're constructed across what was a lake, which is eventually filled in, and then on these sort of glacial terraces going down to the water, um, a competition was held, won by James Craig in 1760, or thereabouts, it may have been 1761 or two, uh, in which the precedent for the winning design was the town of Richelieu. Um, it is a dumbbell plan, meaning that it had um, two squares at either end, one at either end. The idea being you would have sort of monumental buildings or important public buildings uh, terminating uh, the axis, and then in this case, an equestrian statue, and in this case, um, uh, a statue, a column similar to uh, Trajan's column. Th this is the 19th century additions to that. And the lake is filled in, and a public park is inserted uh, within there. There we see a, a drawing of that, uh, probably done sometime around 1800. You can see the sheep down here grazing. <laughs> and um, and eventually the railroad station is inserted down in the valley, and an art museum is actually built uh, adjacent to that. And there we see it. This is Waverly Station. There is the Museum of Art. Here's the castle in the medieval city going down to the Bishop's Palace here. And then here we see Edinburgh Newtown with uh, Charlotte Square and uh, Queen Square uh, running um, this way down Princess Street. St. Andrew's Square, and um, um, I guess it's uh, Charlotte Square. And the effect of the insertion of this, um, of this kind of public park, this pastoral material here, pastoral meaning pasture, meaning grass, uh, is in effect to isolate the medieval city and to then uh, make it into a kind of object of contemplation, something which... Um, approximates um, what the uh, aesthetic philosophers of the time, like Edmund Burke, would call the sublime, something of great antiquity, something um, that shows the power uh, of the natural world, or something of exotic, something of uh, an, an object of contemplation. This is a period, by the way, following on, on this and on into the 19th century when all these medieval parvis in front of the uh, great Gothic churches uh, are cleared so that you could begin to see them as objects. If you recall, um, I talked about the fact that I showed the example of Strasbourg, which was never cleared, or the south portal of Chartres, where you're right up against this wall. In fact, you can't even get far enough back to take a picture of it, even with a 28 millimeter lens, you're, you're right up on it, um, almost like reading Braille. But um, in the beginning in the late 18th and on into the middle of the 19th century, um, the medieval buildings were cleared away, say at Notre Dame de Paris, and then you now go there and there's this big open space where you can actually see the building uh, like this. You see it as an object. Um, in 1832, in France, all of the churches were taken out of the hands of the clergy and were put under the control of what amounted to uh, the Department of the Interior, and specifically the, the Commission on Historic Monuments. So if you think about that, that is a diminution of the traditional form of authority that was embodied in the church as a house of God. Instead, it turns it into a kind of secularized object uh, which has to do with the patrimony and history of the people. You follow me with that? Okay. Um, 
there's an upside and a downside to all things. And I will tell you that the downside of today is this gray light and this drizzling rain. But uh, you owe it to yourself to go across the street to this parking lot and just take a look at the crepe myrtles that are surrounding it uh, and thank your creator uh, for breathing life into you that you can see such beauty against the grayness of the light. It is extraordinary. They just look like they are on fire. And uh, the nature of this particular plant is that when the chlorophyll, the plant stops producing chlorophyll, the carotene pigments, the yellows and reds come forward and are reflecting a different wavelength of light and it just makes them glow as if they were actually embers in a charcoal fire or something. It's really worth going just into that parking lot and looking around. Um, well, we also talked about Regent Street, the Prince Regent, who was living here at Carlton House, the blue that we see down here, and his grand real estate scheme where he was uh, going to create a series of royal crescent-like and royal circus-like structures uh, on the old Mary Lebone or Marleybone estate, um, and he needed to connect the area of uh, the West End here around St. James Square, and he constructed, um, acquired property and constructed this great, this great street known as Regent Street, designed by John Nash beginning in 1809-1811, uh, that would finally be built out by 1841. Um, this, um, because of the Reform Act of 1832 and a sort of redefinition of what we mean by public, um, he really could not make money off of this enterprise. And so um, it just wasn't um, proper, I guess, for him to do that. And so this was given then to the city of Westminster for the greater London to... Um, to create this uh, public park. This was not the first public park to be built. Uh, there was an earlier one in 1833 called Victoria Park in the East End, uh, designed by Robert Pennethorne, but that was never actually built. The green that we see here, um, let me do this so that it will show up on the screen. That's Buckingham Palace, that's Trafalgar Square, that's the location of Carlton House, which was torn down. This was originally the royal grounds associated with Buckingham Palace. It's converted at this end into the public park known today as St. James Park. This one is known as Green Park, and this one is known as Hyde Park. These were former royal grounds that were given over to the city for the purpose of creating a new kind of public space for a new kind of public. Uh, so this precedent is already in place by um, the period of the 19th century when London has grown to nightmarish levels, as we'll see here in a moment. Uh, this is on Regent Street, looking through the um, one of the connecting streets into Golden Square. Um, the red dot that you see in the left diagram with the arrow shows the view. And I'm showing that because uh, we will come in a few minutes to uh, the outbreak of cholera in the 1840s in London, which uh, was centered on Golden Square. And uh, this gave rise then to this sort of reading of the city of this sort of formal part here with disease in the back and um, would lead to um, a lot of things in the modern period in architecture and so forth, trying to create buildings that had no front, no back, uh, which has other problems that come along with it, like where do you put the loading dock? Um, so this is on the left the original scheme, the real estate development scheme, and on the right as it was built out by 1841 where all the buildings uh, have essentially been pushed to the, to the sides, and this is now public, public property. There you actually see the growth of the city coming up here from um, the old West End, moving up across the Marleybone Estate. And you can see how these old fields, small fields, uh, ultimately form this patchwork quilt of these real estate developments as the city begins to uh, really expand. And there it is today from Regent's Park down to St. James Park. 
And there we see it in diagram from Bacon's book on the right. Uh, this, just to orient you, is Downing Street, and this is Westminster Cathedral. Um, so the, at the very same time that um, these sort of real changes are occurring socially and politically and economically, um, there is also this, um, this period here that I'm characterizing from a poem called The City of the Dreadful Night. This is also a term that would be used by Frederick Engels in describing the, the benefactor of Karl Marx in describing conditions in Lancashire, in, specifically in Manchester. Um, and then the way in which this new invention of landscape and the public park is called into public service to try to remediate the uh, awful conditions of, um, of uh, cities as they began to grow in the industrial period. This is that poem by James Thompson, uh, The city is of night, but not of sleep. There, sweet sleep is not for the weary brain. The pitiless hours like years and ages creep, so on and so forth, like a timeless hell. You can, you can read this um, on your own. Now, uh, I want to begin the discussion of the industrial city with this statue, which I encountered in the French city of Blois, B-L-O-I-S. It's absolutely unpronounceable to the English tongue, Blois. Um, but um, I looked at this. It was at the top of this enormous flight of steps with this sort of heroic figure with this contraption here, and I couldn't figure out for the life of me what this contraption was. I'd never seen anything like it. It looked like some sort of can that you would use for insecticide or something. I, I couldn't figure it out. So I got his name, and I jotted it down, and later I looked him up, and his name was Denis Papin. And uh, the contraption that he is uh, putting his hand on there is um, the pressure cooker, right? The pressure cooker. Does everybody in here know what a pressure cooker is? My grandmother used to use pressure cookers. It's, um, it's a pot, and you put it on the stove, and it develops steam under pressure, and it will cook things very rapidly. So if it normally takes, let's say, black-eyed peas, uh, an hour, you know, to cook black-eyed peas in a pressure cooker, you can do it in 20 minutes. Now, from time to time, the pressure, the cooker would build up too much pressure, and the little release valve that was supposed to relieve that pressure uh, would be overloaded, and the thing would explode. Now, it wouldn't blow the top off, but it would send this geyser of, uh, of, of black-eyed pea mush uh, in a straight shot up to the ceiling. And I, I'm very, very familiar with this because until the day I die, I will remember getting on stepladder, scraping the black-eyed peas off the ceiling of my grandmother's kitchen for her when her pressure cooker had overheated. Now, because the steam was under pressure and you had to have a release valve, if you could then, you know, it's, it's a very small step to then take that pressure and hook it up to a cylinder with a piston. And if you could do that, you then had steam power, uh, which James Watt, the Englishman, would do in 1755 or thereabouts. But it's actually the Frenchman, Denis Papin, who invented the steam engine. But it was actually, he was a Frenchman. So it never dawned on him that he could hook it up to a wheel. Um, well, he was a Frenchman, so what was he concerned with? Food, <laughs> all right, um, is a man after my own heart, as you can see. The, um, so um, he wrote a book. On, it was titled um, How to Use This Thing. It was titled um, How to Soften Meat and Extract Bones, right? Um, so you could take something like beef stew that you would cook in a crock pot that takes all day, and you could do it in an hour, right, with this device. Uh, but he, it never dawned on him to use it for anything else because his concerns, of course, was a good pot roast, not a good, not, not a textile mill. Um, he called it the steam digester, and he held a patent on it, and it would, that's what it looked like. That's actually a photograph of his contraption uh, as it eventually um, 
came into the market. You can see how much pressure there is. Look at that lock, that clamp right there. And then this is according to, um, in effect, that's your timer. And then this is your pressure gauge so that you could then adjust that weight, which would allow more steam to escape. Uh, therefore, uh, it wouldn't explode. <laughs> And um, like my grandmothers used to do. Uh, but it was the Englishman, James Watt, who never had a good meal in his life, um, who then figured out that you could take the steam digester of the Pepin and you could uh, actually bleed the steam off into a piston, which could then turn a wheel. And once you could turn that wheel, then you could run machinery, including things like this, the rail car, where the steam under pressure um, is actually turning this piston, which turns this big flywheel. And then that flywheel, see the piston, see the rod here? This piston is moving back and forward. This is on a swivel. This turns this wheel. That turns that wheel. These gears lock. And then you've got the steam locomotive. Now, at this point in time, around 18, well, un until the railroad came around in the 1830s, no human being had ever traveled more than 60 miles per hour. Think about that. You do that every week, right? And you don't even think about it. Going to pick somebody up at the airport. It's uh, Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock. If you're lucky, the Braves are not playing and the traffic is smooth. Uh, and you're driving 60 miles an hour, right? But they didn't know what would happen if a human being traveled 60 miles an hour. They thought we might disintegrate or explode or something, right? A racehorse traveling, um, say, at the Kentucky Derby or something, right, is running about 40 miles an hour. And that's as fast as any human being could go until about 1830. Um, there are reports of people riding the train and getting off. And in the newspaper, the, the report is, is that they all seemed perfectly fine. They were sat down and had tea, and everything was fine, you know, no ill effects. I remember my orthopedist, I had knee surgery a few years ago, and um, it was my first MRI, this was about 20 years ago, and um, she, um, she was telling me that um, when, you, does everybody know how an MRI machine works, right? It gets all the electrons in your body spinning in the same direction, right? These very powerful magnets. And when they began to experiment with it, you know, and they were using rats and gophers and all kinds of things, they weren't sure that what would happen when that all the electrons in your body start spinning in the same direction. They thought you might come apart, right? Uh, same kind of thing here in uh, the 19th century with, with railroads. Now, um, like most technologies, um, I broke down finally after I managed to wash a pair of khaki pants the day before yesterday with my old Verizon flip phone in the front pocket. Um, my old phone is now very clean, but uh, it no longer works. <laughs> and uh, so I had to break down yesterday and go buy an iPhone, which was sort of a milestone in my life because I sound like a Luddite, but I've washed my wife with hers, and I'm convinced that if she was given a choice, you know, if somebody came up and put a gun to her head and said, oh, you have a choice, the life of your husband or your cell phone, she would choose to keep the cell phone, right? Because it's much more entertaining than I am. Um, and I think these things may turn us all into complete blithering idiots by the time we're through. As I told some colleagues in the college computing, you know, we changed our phones at Georgia Tech a number of years ago, and they said, yeah, but you'll have voice over IP, and you can sync it up with your smartphone. I said, look, if I'm hooked up to one more electronic device, I'm going to jump off a building. I mean, there are times in my, I just don't want people to know where I am, right? I want to sit down and read a book, right? <laughs> I want to have a glass of iced tea. I really don't need to play words with friends obsessively at 3 o'clock in the morning. Right? I want to sleep. So... Um, in any event, there was, like any new technology, there was, of course, a, a hope that it would be applied to the problem of the day. And the problem of the day is that labor was intensive, and it was backbreaking, right? 
Now, this rather romantic view from 1857 is sort of uh, at the point where um, we've begun to romanticize a world that has passed, a kind of nostalgia for a world that has passed. And um, as I tell people, that the noble, the, the savage became noble, noble at the point that he was no longer a threat, right? As long as it's a threat, then um, there's nothing particularly noble about it, right? You're, you're sort of trying to protect yourself in any way that you can. Uh, and that's what's happened here. But the point is, is that you, you know, you, you didn't have, I mean, these devices had to run on rails, okay? And so that required a technology that could extrude metal, which led to things like this and this kind of architecture, right? Prior to that time, no matter how much money Louis XIV had, no matter how talented Andrew and Louis Laveau were, they never could have made that wall because they couldn't have made a piece of glass that big and they couldn't extrude metal um, with any strength to it um, that length. Well, railroads changed that because suddenly you had to be able to produce enormous quantities of extruded iron. Uh, in fact, um, so much so that in about 1809, there was a bridge built in a little mining town in the west of England. I forget the name of that town. I need to look that up. But it was a little town. And, the, and people came from miles around, came from all over, riding this new railroad device to see this bridge because the bridge was made with extruded iron pieces that were bolted together. And they were so proud of this bridge that they renamed their town Iron Bridge. So, you know, it's sort of like Atlanta renaming itself Spaghetti Junction or something, right? I mean, it's, it would be sort of the equivalent of that. Um, and there it is, actually. It's, um, and, of course, it was a huge boom to the economy. All these tourists, the hotels were built, spas, restaurants opened. And um, so immediately everybody got into the business of building out of structural iron, prefabricated pieces. Well... In a short period of time, uh, the British, I should mention, passed all kinds of laws trying to protect this technology. Guess what? They failed, right? You can't do that. Sooner or later, it gets out. And um, in, the United States was desperate to try to, the fledgling United States, to try to figure out how to, you know, make steam engines. And people would go over and they would sort of look at these things and they would sort of try to remember how they worked and then they would go back to their hotel and they would draw little sketches of it or something, you know. And um, eventually, because of that, um, out of ignorance and misunderstanding, uh, this guy named Corliss created this giant steam engine here which improved upon Watt's engine because it actually had double pistons. And so the problem was you would get condensation inside the piston in Watt's engine, which would then diminish its power. And what Corliss figured out is if you could bleed that steam out and dump it into the second piston, you could actually have two pistons running simultaneously, right? And it increased the power to the point where uh, this thing produced 1,000 horsepower, 1,000 horsepower. This is the one from the Centennial Exposition of 1876 in what is now Fairmount Park in Philadelphia. And this was the engine that would fuel the textile industry uh, on into the 20th century, that engine, the Corliss engine. Now, the interesting thing about an engine, a steam engine that produces 1,000 horsepower, is it takes about two pounds of cold, you know, a bucket, that much coal per horsepower per day, okay? So if you're producing 2,000 horsepower or 1,000 horsepower, you're talking about a lot of coal. And because these things would get very hungry very quickly, 
and um, and thus the uh, the mining industry of the production of coal, um, which um, well, I think the photograph speaks for itself. It's not something you would want to do, but it was something you would need to do if you needed to put food on the table for your family. Well, all of this had a pretty profound impact on, industri on cities because um, with the growth of, of, of industry, manufacturing, um, which really begins in northern Europe, um, there are changes in the location of wealth and poverty. What do I mean by that? I mean, up until banking is invented in the Renaissance, um, all wealth is in the land, right? What you could grow on it, uh, what you could defend, um, the crops that you could get from it and so forth and sell in market or the sheep that you could shear and sell the wool, so on and so forth. The whole sort of colonial enterprise in North America and most of South America was based on a similar, on a similar thing, that, that actually you are growing a crop which then you are exporting back, which is being converted, manufactured into something else, cloth. And keep in mind that, I don't know how many of these I have, I don't know, a dozen, right? If I had lived in 1800, if I had owned three of these, I would have probably been, that would have been a sign that I was an extremely wealthy person, right? Because these had to be made by hand. So again, there's an upside and a downside to this, right? The fact is you can buy one of these things cheap, um, you can have a clean shirt to wear, feels good, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, and I think also if you want to sort of figure out where the next economic explosion is going to be, follow the textile industry, right? In the United States, it started in New England. After the Civil War, it moved south. It then, beginning in the 1960s, but by the 1980s, it had moved offshore. Uh, it was in Nicaragua and places like that, and then it moved to um, China, India, and other places. You follow that textile industry, you will see the next wave of economic development, of economic growth. Um, well, in London and Westminster, which is most of London, this shows this rapid growth in population that begins around 1800 and, um, and just explodes so that um, no city in the world is this big. And London would maintain um, its position as the largest city in the world for a very long period of time. Um, certainly in 1901 it was. And if you track where these large cities were in uh, the middle of the uh, 1800s or by 1900, most of them are in Europe. Berlin. Berlin was like the eighth largest city in the world. Well, I mean, Berlin is... It's not very big, and today it's probably, you know, I don't know, ranks number 118 or something in population. Well, London grew uh, incredibly rapidly, and the Industrial Revolution, particularly the textile industry, these photographs are um, self-explanatory. Uh, that's a bobbin checker in South Carolina in 1912, up around Anderson, Greenville, Spartanburg, the textile belt there. Um, and here in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1909. Um, there were no child labor laws. Uh, there was no OSHA, you know, occupational safety, health, etc. Uh, there were no controls whatsoever. And so uh, child labor was, um, child labor was actually um, preferable because they were paid about 11 and a half cents a week. And in New England, um, particularly if you were a farmer and you hadn't had enough sense to get out of New Hampshire um, and go to Ohio or Illinois or Iowa somewhere, uh, you were still sort of trying to farm this gravelly, rocky soil. And you had a whole lot of daughters. Uh, those are mouths to feed, and so you would basically uh, farm your daughters out to uh, the textile mills in Lowell or Lawrence, Massachusetts, uh, they would then have room and board. Uh, they would earn a little bit of income that they could send back home. And um, then on Sunday, they got moral instruction. 
That was the, usually the contract. Why do you think small children were preferable? Not only because they earn less money, but why do you think they were preferable in a machine like this? Small hands. And typically the children would go up, when the machine would jam, the children would go up under the machine to unjam the machine. The machine would start up and it would cut off a finger, a hand or something. And so, um, but there was no rule, no law, no nothing uh, against this. And um, it was um, prevalent all over the world um, and certainly in Manchester. And um, it produced uh, living conditions um, such as this New York tenement house that we see here on the left, which we'll come to more in a moment. And these, uh, the Red Hill Mills here in Yorkshire, um, in the east of England, um, northeast of England. Well, in cities like London, which were now growing by leaps and bounds, um, there had also been a lot of land reform that closed the old commons uh, that peasants had been able to graze their milk cows on and so forth. And um, thus, people came into the cities looking for work. And um, there were no land use controls, so there was no zoning of any kind. And you could have, so you could have a mortuary next to uh, an apartment building, next to a brewery, next to a school. Right? There was no sort of um, designation of where incompatible land uses might need to locate. This is uh, London, 1846, the Lion Street Brewery, which was next to a pickle factory. And all of this went into these cesspits. All the waste material went into cesspits that were in courtyards behind the buildings. They didn't have, they weren't connected to sewers. London did not have an encapsulated sewer system until the second half of the 19th century. So most of this waste material simply went into sewers. Conditions became very overcrowded. There were an enormous homeless population. Charitable organizations created, like the Salvation Army, the Young Men's Christian Association, YMCA, and so forth. Um, and a lot of churches and other things got into the act, creating these workhouses where people would, um, would live. You know, and then they would work making brooms or making something. Um, adults here, as well as um, men, women, typically separate. Um, and this is actually showing, I think, the St. George's Workhouse here, which was near um, Golden Square, St. Giles Workhouse, uh, St. James Workhouse in 1834. And then um, well, a lot of reformers, a lot of people were horrified by these rapidly decaying urban conditions. And um, it was exacerbated by the fact that, um, now this is going to sound strange to us, but we didn't have automobiles. So the means of transportation were horses. Horses poop, and they poop in the streets. And that then washes into the storm drains, which washes into uh, the water supply, because the majority of the water um, was actually taken from shallow wells. So disease, again, was a problem. And finally, uh, cholera broke out uh, in 1846. It broke out again. In, um, uh, there, there were two major epidemics, and as many as 40,000 people would die in a three-month period, that kind of thing. So um, you can see this, a court for King Cholera. You would have these kinds of editorial cartoons uh, in newspapers and magazines sort of pressing uh, the authorities to reform the city uh, in some way. And uh, the first epidemic of 1846 broke out here. There's Regent Street. There's the quadrant that we see. Broke out right there at a pump called the Broad Street Pump. Now, if you're interested in this, and it's a heck of a story, um, you can, um, there's a book called The Strange Case of the Broad Street Pump. I read it in two days. It was a great read. Um, and there's a website, which I have here from UCLA, that talks about all of this in their School of Public Health. Um, 
they weren't sure where cholera, what cholera was. The prevailing scientific belief in 1846 was that disease was caused by breathing foul vapors. You breathed it in. This was called miasma. You breathed in miasma. I always wondered in these movies like Gone with the Wind where all these sort of people like Scarlett O'Hara that said, oh, I have the vapors. I have to go outside. You know, what that was about. What the heck are the vapors? Well, the belief was that you breathed it, right? Um, it was a man named John Snow who was a doctor who ultimately, who hypothesized and ultimately proved that cholera was a small organism, microscopic organ organism that was contained in dirty water, right? And by drinking this water, it gave you the disease. The breakthrough came when he tracked people who had contracted cholera, and then he tracked their movements. And there were a set of sisters who had gone to visit their aunt, and um, one of the sisters had tea, but the other one did not. And both the aunt and the sister, uh, they just had lemonade, and therefore the water had not been boiled. And because the water had not been boiled, um, the person who had who had, the two who had the lemonade actually contracted cholera, right? Which put him on to the fact that it was in the water. Uh, but everybody thought he was actually almost expelled from the Royal Society because of his theories. He published this. Well, this was the location of this pump. Now, what had happened is that the pump, the well casing, was made of brick, and the mortar had disintegrated. And so the cesspit, where all the human waste, you know, you die from cholera from dehydration. You expel your body like food poisoning, simply expels everything in it, and you die from dehydration. Um, and so you'd have sheets and so forth that would be soaked with the bodily fluids. You would t take all that stuff up, and rather than burning it or boiling it, you would just throw it in the cesspit, right? All of that then leaked out and through the well casing of this pump. And the way that um, John Snow actually um, zeroed in on this was what I think may be the first use of geographic information systems. There's the pump, which is now a monument, believe, <laughs> believe it or not. And across the street is uh, the John Snow pub. Right? So you have to go in and raise a pint to Jon Snow, the grandfather of public health, modern public health. Um, the way he did this is that he tracked it and mapped cholera outbreaks. And he noticed that in certain areas there was almost no cholera at all, and in other areas there were very high incidences of cholera. So he kind of zeroed in on where the high incidences were, and he came to the conclusion that ground zero was this pump right here and that everybody in this building had died of cholera. Each bar, each line represents um, a death from cholera. This is his map of 1854. Well, it isn't advancing for reasons totally unknown. We have two minutes left. So I will breeze through this and stop when we get to New York. So now you understand Mumford's quote, right? Out front, fine silk, in the back, tuberculosis. Well, London at this time, as was common actually all, all around the world, um, water was supplied contractually by various water companies who obtained the right under license to pump water. And by correlating the cholera outbreaks with the um, sources of water, whether it was from a shallow well, as the Broad Street pump was, or here, he noticed that no one in the Lambeth water intake got sick, but everybody in the Southwark water intake got sick. Right? This is the website right here. It's fantastic. Um, it's really great. That's where I took these maps. So here you can see Lambeth and water, Chelsea Waterworks, 
which was fine. Um, but um, now this was also important, and it was important because um, you didn't have wealthy areas and poor areas. You had um, they were mixed together, all in the same sort of water intake place. So it was crossing uh, economic lines. And uh, therefore, there was a huge push to sort of try to fix this. This is the Lambeth water intake, the sort of gray-red that you see, actually. And then you see Southwark, and Southwark was the one that made everybody sick. This is one of those pumps. This was an editorial um, showing actually then uh, in 1858 the great stink. <laughs> and you'll see sort of, you know, early photographs of, of women with children and they've got masks on because they don't, they're, they, they're afraid they're going to breathe in the miasma. This is the Thames, right? And um, all right, I think we will stop here and I will continue on, what's today, Friday? I will continue on Monday uh, with our next sort of case study, which is New York and the development of the public park as an instrument of social and public health reform, okay? If anyone has any questions, please let me know.